Uh, for our second talk in this session, uh, we'll hear from Stephen Piddock uh, from Royal Holloway, uh, who will tell us, uh, along the theme of quantum walks, uh, a talk about elves, trees, and, and quantum walks. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you. So yes, this is uh, another talk about quantum walks, uh, and this is joint work with Simon. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so the first thing uh, you should ask when you see this title is, is what does ELFS mean? Uh, it's a made up word. Uh, so it stands for electric flow sampling. It's the abbreviation we chose. Uh, and I'll start by just describing what that is. So our setup is fine. We have a simple graph and we're starting at one particular vertex, which we're labeling S. And there's a set of vertices marked M, uh, which will be the marked vertices that we want to find. So it's a kind of standard search problem on a graph. Uh, and we can define an electric flow from S to M in the following way. So a flow is an assignment of numbers to the edges of the graph, uh, such that for all of the vertices that aren't in S or M, uh, the amount of flow going in is the same as the amount of flow going out. And then the electric flow it's the unique flow uh, that can be defined in terms of voltages at each vertex. So you can assign another number called a voltage to each vertex, and then the amount of flow along an edge will be the difference between the two voltages. So that defines an, the electric flow between S and M. And with that, we're now able to define what electric flow sampling is. OK, so we repeat the following process. First, we sample an edge from the graph with probability proportional to the square of the electric flow through that edge. Okay. So there's a normalization constant here, which is the sum of the squares of all the flows. And if you know about electrical networks, you'll recognize that quantity is often called the effective resistance between S and M. Uh, but that's not going to be important for the rest of the talk. Uh, you don't need to remember the effect of resistance here. Okay, so we pick a random edge, and then once we've picked a random edge, we then pick a random end of that edge Okay, to get a new vertex. So for example, uh, with this graph here, this S and this M, we might pick a particular edge according from the electric flow, and then we'll pick a random endpoint, and we'll start again. So now we've got a new vertex S where we're starting, we, uh, sample, cr creating the electric flow again and sampling from that flow. So again, we'll pick another random edge uh, and pick uh, a random endpoint of that edge to get a new starting vertex. And we keep on going uh, and eventually we'll pick a vertex that's in M and at that point we stop. Okay, so this ELSE process is just a, a new random process on a graph that moves from some starting vertex, vertex S to uh, one of a number of marked vertex in a set, which we label M. OK. So uh, this talk's going to be all about uh, analyzing this process. So to start off with, I'll talk uh, in what we can say in generality. Uh, and this is really by showing a very nice and quite tight connection to just classical random walks, your normal random walk. Uh, then we'll see how the ELF process performs when we're restricted to the special case of trees. Uh, when the graph's a tree, we can say a bit more about how fast this process uh, terminates. And then Finally, only at the end of the talk will I get onto the quantum algorithms part of the talk. So there I'll show how you can implement the ELPS process with a quantum algorithm and what benefits you get from doing so. OK, so this ELPS process uh, can be described as a Markov chain. So you have a series of points, which I've denoted with capital Ys here, which are the vertices that you sample at each step in the ELPS process. So we'll have some y0 being s, and then y1, y2, et cetera, up to some y rho. And this rho will be the number of steps it took to get there, 
which we'll call the electric hitting time. And we'll just use capital EHT to denote the expected electric hitting time. So this is uh, to be compared with your classical random walk, where uh, in this process, when you're at a vertex, you just pick a neighbor uniformly at random, and you walk through the graph until you hit the marked set M. So uh, analogously, we have the random walk hitting time, which is just the expected number of steps of that Markov process. Okay, so our, our first main result is this connection between these two Markov chains. So in particular, if you take your classical random walk and just interrupt it at a series of random points, then the distribution that you get on those points will be exactly the same as the distribution you get just from carrying out the ELFS process. Okay, so there are some, uh, you have to have some good choice of random stopping times in order to make this happen. Uh, but when you do, you get this coupling between the classical random walk and the ELFS process. So one uh, important corollary that we get straight away from this result is that running the ELFS process and the random walk process end up with the same probability distribution on the marked elements once you get to the set M. Okay? You can think of your uh, ELFS process as just being uh, a sub-sample of your classical random walk. So in particular, the arrival distribution you get when you hit the marked set M, this will be the same for both of these processes. Okay, so how does this work? How do you uh, get this coupling? Well, you have to choose uh, a clever random stopping rule. So what you do is when you're running your classical random walk, when you get to a vertex X, you decide whether or not you're going to stop and output a sample or if you're going to carry on with your random walk. So uh, the probability with which you decide whether or not you stop uh, is given by uh, this P of X here, uh, which depends in some quite complicated fashion on the voltages at X and at all the neighboring vertices. Uh, the exact form of this expression, I don't think you can get too much from. Uh, but if you know the voltages everywhere, then you can just calculate this exactly. If you were just running the classical random walk uh, without any more information, then you wouldn't know how to calculate this probability and uh, run this stopping rule efficiently. Uh, one thing you can get from the exact expression here is that the probability of stopping once you get to the marked set is 1. So you won't uh, carry on running the classical walk after you've hit the marked set. And the next question you might ask is, well, how long will you run your classical walk for until you interrupt it and get a sample from your, uh, your electric flow sample? OK, so we can calculate this exactly. And uh, one of our results is to show that this expected spotting, stopping time, i.e. the number of classical walk steps to create one ELFS electric flow sample, it's again given by some expression involving the voltages. Uh, we couldn't find this expression in terms of voltages anywhere in the literature. Uh, and we ended up uh, coming up with a, a new name for it, uh, which is ET. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're able to show that this expression also characterizes another natural property of a classical random walk, uh, which is the escape time. So if you were running this classical random walk from S to M, and you were to count uh, the last time that you hit your starting vertex before you then went uh, to the marked set, then the expected value of that last time of hitting S is, is exactly this value, ET, the escape time. OK, so by randomly interrupting your uh, classical random walk, uh, on a time that's on average about this escape time, uh, you'll be taking ELF electric flow samples uh, from your graph. 
um, implementing the ELFS process. So in particular, if you add up the escape times at all of the uh, ELFS sample, uh, sorry, all of the vertices in your ELFS process, then you'll just get the entire classical random walk. And so the sum of all of those escape times will be exactly equal to the hitting time of the classical random walk from S to M. And a nice consequence of that is that uh, because the escape time's bigger than one, uh, you know that uh, just the, the number of terms in this sum, which is the electric hitting time, the number of samples, is less than the classical hitting time. Okay, so the, the main takeaways uh, from this coupling between the classical random walk and the ELFS process are that the ELFS process is faster than the classical random walk. That's the, the final result we've got here. And that they have the same arrival distribution when you get to the marked set. Okay, so now uh, move on to the second part, uh, which is about how this ELFS process performs uh, on graphs on trees. So the thing that we're interested in is this electric hitting time. We know it's better than the, the classical hitting time, but how much better can it be? So a good simple example to think of is just uh, a line with one end in the marked set and starting at the other end. Then the electric flow from S to M is just the straight line flow along this line. And so when you take uh, an electric flow sample, you're going to sample a random edge from anywhere along the line. So on average, you're going to about half your distance uh, with each ELF sample that you take. And so the, the electric hitting time to get to the end is about log of the length of the line. So there's a very straightforward proof for the case of a, a line. But things get more difficult when you think about more complicated graphs. And already, if you were just to mark both ends of this line, things already get a lot more complicated, at least in the analysis. So now there's some flow uh, going to the left and some flow going to the right. And the electric flow is such that you'll be very much biased towards going towards the closer end. So the, it encapsulates a lot of information about which is the best path to take. But if you do take the, the wrong path, as it were, the longer path, then you'll take a uniform sample across the whole of that long path. So there's a chance that even though you are very near to one end, you now get randomly distributed along the whole line again. And that makes calculating this electric hitting time much harder. OK, some other case, well, one other case where we can calculate the electric hitting time exactly is the complete graph, where uh, everything's so symmetrical you can just calculate it exactly. Uh, and the exact expression's a bit complicated, so I've just written the uh, effective asymptotics, uh, which say the electric hitting times uh, less than both the number of marked elements and uh, the number of vertices divided by that. So if you were just to run a classical random walk, then the hitting time would be n over m, uh, because your probability of hitting a marked vertex at each time would just be m over n. Uh, so when you have a small number of marked vertices, this electric hitting time is much better on the complete graph. And a uh, very similar result holds for expander graphs as well. Okay, so our main theorem here is that on trees, the electric hitting time is always a most logarithmic in n, the number of vertices in the tree. Uh, this is the most technical part of the paper. Uh, so I'll just give an incredibly high level sketch. Uh, the idea is to divide the graph up into smaller, more manageable parts. Uh, and we can do this uh, by using what's called a, a sure complement. So here you can take uh, some part of your tree, say this right hand part, and just replace it with a single edge, uh, where this edge you might be able to see uh, is slightly thicker in the diagram, and that's meant to represent uh, it being a weighted edge. And the weight we attach to it is uh, related to the effective resistance of the entire part of the graph that we were replacing. 
So by doing this replacement, the uh, electric flows look similar in the remaining parts of the graph that we've kept. And so we can do the analysis on this smaller graph. Uh, the way the proof then proceeds is by uh, working up from the bottom. So working up from the, mark, from the leaves and the marked elements and showing that the number of steps uh, that you uh, will need to take below a certain point in your tree uh, is some function of what's going on below that. And so we can then uh, uh, work back up to get the whole bound. OK, so on to the final part, uh, the quantum algorithm part of this talk. So we can implement the ELSE process uh, using quantum walks. So in particular, we can create what we call a flow state, uh, this state here, which is uh, some superposition over edges with the coefficient of each edge uh, proportional to the amount of electric flow through that edge uh, using quantum walks. And so when we measure that state, we get an electric flow sample. And then we can just immediately implement the ELSE process from there. So uh, there's another talk uh, on Friday uh, from Shelby where she'll say how you can uh, use this state in cleverer ways than just measuring it and starting it again and repeating uh, to solve some other problems, uh, including finding paths OK, so I'll very briefly uh, describe the quantum walk. Uh, so the operator is uh, close to the usual quantum walk operator, where which is a product of two reflections. Uh, one is reflection of, around the anti-symmetric space, uh, which you might commonly just seen called the swap operator. Uh, and the other reflects around what we call the star state at each vertex. So that's the state of a uniform superposition of all the neighbors around a particular vertex. Uh, the difference for our quantum walk operator is uh, a difference that was introduced by Belovs uh, in his electrical network quantum walk paper, uh, where you don't do this reflection at the start and end. So you don't do it at S or M. But otherwise, this is the standard quantum walk operator. Uh, just the product of these two reflections. So now, the thing to note is that the electric flow state is orthogonal to both of those spaces. Uh, because the flow from x to y is the negative of the flow from y to x, it's orthogonal to all the sym symmetric spaces, called symmetric states. And because the flow is conserved everywhere apart from at s and m, uh, it's orthogonal to all of those star states. So in particular, this electric flow state is an eigenvector of the quantum walk operator. And so to prepare it, we're going to use phase estimation. So we start in a state, a star state uh, centered on S, our starting vertex. And then we apply fa phase estimation to project onto the zero eigenspace. And this will pick out exactly the electric flow state. So the accuracy to which we prepare it depends how long we run phase estimation for. Uh, and we can use the effective spectral gap lemma to show that uh, the time we need to run for uh, scales as the square root of the escape time divided by epsilon. So note that this, this new quantity that we hadn't seen before until we started thinking about the ELSE process it has come up again uh, when we did phase estimation here. Uh, which I think is really surprising. So uh, for uh, the interrupting the classical random walk, it would take about escape time steps to create an ELSE sample. And here we can do it quantumly in square root of that time. OK, so uh, the overall quantum walk algorithm for uh, implementing the whole ELSE process will take roughly some of the this square root of escape time at all of the samples we choose, uh, which is, remember, less than uh, the sum of the sorry, less than the sum of the escape times. And remember that was equal to the classical hitting time. 
So this looks like it will always be better than the classical hitting time. However, once we take errors into account, uh, the best bound we can come up with is slightly more complicated. And in this case, it's square root of the classical hitting time times some polynomial in the electric hitting time. So in the case where the electric hitting time is very fast, like on trees, then we get an approximate square root speed up uh, compared to just running a classical random walk. But the important thing is this quantum algorithm we have, compared to previous quantum algorithms uh, for finding marked vertices, now returns that marked vertex with the same probability distribution as the classical random walk would have done. And so if you have any classical algorithm that used the classical random walk to sample from some marked set, then we can replace that with this quantum algorithm. And there are uh, a lot of exciting things that we could try and apply this to, uh, but we haven't worked through the details uh, of any of those yet, but that's, that's gonna be the next step. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we introduced this ELFS process, which is very tightly connected to just your classical random walk. We know that it performs very well on trees, uh, but don't have such good bounds on more general graphs. And we can implement it with a quantum walk algorithm, which will uh, sample from that marked set with the same distribution as the classical random walk. Uh, so the remaining open questions, one interesting one is whether you can actually do electric flow sampling classically without the knowledge of what the voltages are everywhere. And to carry on and explore those quantum applications that I su uh, suggested on the previous slide. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the great talk. Um, do we have questions? Hi, thank you for a cool talk. Um, so you have this example of trees where the electric hitting time is small, it's fast, logarithmic. Are there any known examples where it isn't small? Like, is it known that it can be big, or? Uh, yes, so we know it's always at least as good as the classical hitting time, yes. but it can be about the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, one example is a binary tree where all of the leaves are marked, mm -hmm. and in that case, uh, your classical hitting time is very good. It's about the depth of the tree anyway, because oh, you're biased to be moving downwards the whole time. Mm -hmm. And the electric hitting time can't be any better than the depth of the tree. Yeah. So they're about the same in that example. OK, yeah. thanks. <laughs> thanks for a great talk, Stephen. Um, so this seems to be kind of you know, motivated by electric flows on some network of resistors or something like this. Uh, are there any applications of these algorithms to studying something in electrical engineering, or is it? Yeah, so uh, I didn't mention this tool. So quantities like the effective resistance are things that you can calculate. Um, so there have been previous quantum algorithms for doing that. Uh, and uh, one small result that we get from this result is that we can do it in a time that scales with the escape time rather than, uh, I think it was commute time in a previous algorithm. Uh, I don't know how useful it is to be able to compute those effective resistances practically for actual electronic engineering purposes. I don't know. Thanks. Any other questions? So actually, I have one. Uh, I, maybe I I'm, don't fully have a good intuitive uh, understanding of this electric hitting time. I mean, uh, one particular thing that uh, kind of troubled me was somehow you know you have O log n electric hitting time on trees, but on a complete graph, if I remember correctly from your expression, if you pick the size of a the set to be like say square root of n, you have a worse hitting time, which kind of you know, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive because I thought you would mix faster on a, on a complete graph where things are well connected. So maybe can you uh, give me some intuition why that is the case? Yeah, so I guess 
uh, when you have, I mean, one intriguing thing about this expression compared to a classical random walk is that the, yeah, the, the time can get worse as you increase the number of mark vertices. Whereas generally you think if there are more mark vertices to find, they should be easier to find and you'll find them faster. And that's certainly true with your classical hitting time. But yeah, here you can, uh, it can get worse. And indeed, that could be worse than on a tree, even though you've got more connections. Uh, and the problem is the electric flow just spreads out so much uh, that you, uh, your probability will just be on any one of those edges, which won't be getting you any closer uh, to where you need to get to. Uh, so it's like the competition or something between different sync nodes or something. Is um, that the right way to think about it? Yeah, so exactly, because there are so many, uh, they split the uh, electric flow into smaller and smaller amounts. So the uh, probability of you getting one of the edges next to one of those mark nodes is, is less because it's split across all of them. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Stephen.